Welcome to this review and recap session. This final part of the course provides you with an overview of the whole course that you've completed and it will help cement your learning and will help you begin to decide what it is you want to do next. So let's just start by getting your brain back in gear. This is everything that you've covered in this course. In module one, you looked at personal motivations and self-development. In module two, you looked at counselling theory. And remember, we looked at psychodynamic, person-centred and CBT. In module three, you looked at the core conditions of therapy and counselling skills. In module four, you looked at establishing helping relationships, setting goals and managing endings. In module five, you looked at working ethically and within the law. And finally, in module six, you looked at supervision and self-development. So let's start with a quick review of what we did in module one. We focused on self-reflection and self-development. This is a vital area of your work and it's a vital and lifelong pursuit, essential if you want to become a competent and skilled helper or counsellor. This involves being honest about your motivations, which is not always easy, and this can be sometimes a bit uncomfortable. It's about consciously working on improving your limitations, your mindset, and being open to accepting other people with an open heart. The rewards can be great when you're able to know yourself and face your own emotional or psychological discomfort and enable yourself and others to move forward. Do you remember that we looked at the first model, the Johari window? The Johari window can help you with your self-development. And remember, this is an important part of the model. It's all about working on yourself through feedback and self-reflection. And this ensures that the open area gets bigger and bigger as you discover things about yourself and you work on self-improvement and self-awareness for the benefit of yourself and importantly, your client. We looked at how having an open mindset will enable us to grow and develop our skills beyond anything sometimes we thought was possible. With time and practice, all of us can develop a more open mindset. In module two, we looked at the three main theoretical perspectives. The first was psychodynamic approaches. And if you remember, this approach focuses on changing problematic behaviours, feelings and thoughts by discovering their unconscious meanings and motivations. Remember that we do this by exploring the past in psychodynamic theory. We find the answers from the past and these help us explain a person's current behaviour. We looked at some of the early work of Freud. He divided the mind into three parts the unconscious, the pre-conscious and the conscious mind. For Freud, the unconscious formed the largest part of the mind and he believed this had an important bearing on behaviour in daily life and it helped explain psychological distress. The stored feelings, thoughts and experiences in the unconscious directly influence behaviour, but these are often unknown to the person. The person does not consciously understand why they react and behave as they do. The role of therapy is to begin the process of bringing the unknown from the unconscious mind into the pre-conscious and conscious state. He described the pre-conscious states when someone can recall something into the conscious mind. It's information about yourself that's just below the surface of consciousness. Freud believed that bringing feelings and thoughts from the unconscious and pre-conscious mind into conscious awareness relieved psychological distress. Id, the ego and the superego? Well, remember that Freud believed that the tensions between the demands of the id, the ego and the superego and the repression of our desires results in disruptions in the balance of our psyche, which leads to anxiety and repressed feelings. These repressed feelings sit in our unconscious and through talking therapy, we aim to bring these from the unconscious into consciousness. And once we bring them into our conscious mind, we can begin to understand them and make sense of them. 
it's important that the client is provided with a safe environment to explore their past, and this is made possible by the presence of the core conditions. Remember, unconditional positive regard, congruence and non-judgment are an important part of this therapy and many others. Remember that psychodynamic theory, more so than probably other theories, plays close attention to transference and countertransference. Remember that transference happens when the client unconsciously transfers emotions onto the counsellor and countertransference is when the counsellor reacts to the client's emotions or attitudes. The second theoretical perspective we covered was humanistic approaches. And remember, this early work was developed by people like Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow and Clark Moustakis. We focus specifically on person-centred therapy. Remember that person-centred theory and therapy is all about the here and now, and it focuses on the conscious mind. It focuses on what the client is experiencing now, their current behaviours and understanding how they feel and working on how they live their life now. From this realisation through therapy, change can take place. Remember we looked at Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. We talked about the fact that if any part of the hierarchy is absent, then a person is unable to fulfil their full potential. Having certain aspects of our human needs missing results in psychological disturbance. A person can achieve different parts of the hierarchy whilst other parts are missing. So, for example, a person may still have insecure employment, but have strong and supportive family and friends that help them through their life. Maslow argued that in order to meet our full potential or to self-actualise, each part of the pyramid needs to be present. Within person-centred therapy or PCT, the therapist is there to help the client regain their self-awareness about their feelings in relation to those unsatisfied needs and enable them to view the resulting negative feelings in a non-threatening objective manner. And by accepting positive feelings, the client can strengthen their self-image and self-esteem, enabling them to move forward with their life. As you'll remember, Three core conditions are critical within person-centred therapy, and these must be present if the client is able to move forward. They are inextricably woven together, and the absence of one of these conditions can impact on the ability of a client to open up, talk about their story, and feel safe to explore the changes they want to make. The third approach we looked at was cognitive and behavioural approaches. We looked at CBT in particular. This approach focuses on learning's role in developing both normal and abnormal behaviour. In person-centred therapy, CBT is all about the here and now, and it focuses on the conscious mind. The focus is on what the client is experiencing now, their current behaviour and understanding how they feel and working on how they live their life now. We looked at the CBT process. CBT focuses on how we think and assumes that our thought processes affect we, the way we behave. It's based on the principle that our behaviour is generated by a series of stimuli and responses to these thought processes. The model explains the cycle of thoughts creating feelings, feelings resulting in our behaviour and how behaviour then reinforces those thoughts. CBT is based on the concept that changing unhelpful thinking patterns can have a positive impact on someone's emotions. The focus of therapy is to concentrate on identifying, analysing and changing negative cognitions and behaviours. CBT focuses on insight arising from an understanding that thoughts create feelings, feelings result in behaviour and behaviour reinforces thoughts. CBT can help clients see the world differently and from the one they've created through their automatic negative thoughts. We then moved on to module three. And in module three, we looked at the core conditions and the development of counseling skills in a lot more detail. 
As councillors, we recognise that we are the ones who make the difference as to whether these core conditions are developed and maintained throughout therapy. This is why self-development and self-awareness are so important. If you remember, we looked at how we develop rapport and its role in establishing a connection with another person. Remember that conversation only accounts for about 7% of our communications with each other. Remember that we read body language, we feel tension, we look for facial expressions to change. We get a feeling about someone and we decide if they like us or not. This begins the moment you have contact with a client, including phone calls, emails, how you greet them when they arrive and how you introduce yourself and where you meet them. We then looked at active listening, helping you understand what it is and the part this plays in establishing rapport and demonstrating empathy through the skill of active listening. By listening carefully to all the clues you're given, both verbal and non-verbal, you can begin to gain an understanding of the client and they can begin to make a connection with you. We looked at a useful checklist called SOLAR and this is really helpful when you want to develop and improve your skills of what are called attending behaviours. These attending behaviours help the client feel safe so they have a safe space to express what's going on for them. This then begins to give you an insight into their world, the clients here and now. We then moved on to module four and we looked at the importance of setting boundaries in the helping relationship. Boundaries are set to protect you and the other person. They help you both understand what you can expect from the relationship. This applies to the counsellor, the client and other people that you work with. Remember that we said it's important to consider your physical safety, your psychological safety and the emotional safety of all parties. Within this module, we looked at the limits of confidentiality. Remember, this is so important. The limits of confidentiality and need for these to be fully discussed with the client is so crucial. This should be done in the initial contracting discussions with the client. The client must understand that if they disclose something to you that breaks the law or places themselves or someone else at risk, you are duty bound to report what you know to the authorities. Within this module, we then looked at the five goals of therapy and why it's so important to agree these with the client and review progress. This helps the client understand the focus of therapy and helps them manage and you manage their realistic expectations of the process. If you'll remember, the first goal is to provide a supportive and listening environment. The second goal is about helping to manage a problem. And this is about dealing with something small to begin with, which can help clients begin to build their confidence. So they're then able to tackle much bigger problems in their lives. The third goal is about the management of problems. Many problems can be large and complicated. Counselling can help clients break down their problems into small steps that they can then work on with the ultimate aim of achieving their goal of addressing a bigger issue. The fourth goal is about altering poor skills that often result in repeated patterns of behaviour or creating the same negative problems. The fifth goal is about applying counselling skills to bring about a client's changed outlook on life. This includes the client developing skills and resilience that enables them to move forward positively and deal with life's problems and changes in their life. We then moved on to looking at another model, the six stages of change. Remember stage one was about pre-contemplation. This is when you feel that there really isn't any need to change or you deny that you've got a problem. People don't usually seek counselling at this stage. Stage two is about contemplation. And at this point, the client is willing to admit there's a problem, but they're still not ready to tackle it. Stage three is then about preparation and determination. At this stage, the client has decided the advantages of changing outweigh the disadvantages and they're probably going to take action quite soon. 
They may take small steps first, but they're already beginning to plan and start seeking solutions to their problems. In stage four, this is the action stage. This is where you go ahead with your plans and you start to incorporate new, healthier habits in your everyday life. You understand why some aspects of your problem happen and you're beginning to take responsibility for your part in it. Stage five then is about maintenance. It's about staying on track. You're establishing healthier patterns of behaving and thinking and it doesn't feel that odd to you anymore. Remember that relapse is common, especially when stressful things happen, but you now have different and new skills and strategies to help you cope. In stage six, this is called termination and it's the ultimate target where the new behaviour is a part of you like anything else and no matter what hits you in your life, you don't return to the old habits or behaviours from the past. Remember that before termination, you can find yourself back to any previous stage. We finished module four by looking at ending a helping relationship and why it's so important to plan for this. Planning for the ending of the relationship in advance is very important to help prepare you and your client for the relationship to end. Abrupt or unplanned endings can be very upsetting and unsettling for the client. You then completed module five. And in module five, we looked at the ethical frameworks and the law in which you work. Remember the ethics or rules of conduct, how you behave, or the moral standards you apply in different situations. They reflect what's right and wrong in terms of your behaviour in each situation. Each of us have developed our own moral compass and our own set of personal ethics. And remember in counselling, there are a set of ethics that you should be working to, and these are set by the governing bodies that each of us work in. We then looked at the three pillars of an ethical framework. The ethical framework is shaped by a combination of our own personal system of ethics, relevant ethical codes of conduct relating to counselling and society's moral and legal standards. The key aspects of the ethical framework are values, ethical principles and personal moral qualities. We then looked at what discrimination is and what you need to be aware of in terms of the law. Discrimination is when you treat someone differently and unfairly compared to other people because of their personal characteristics. For example, this could be related to age, race, sexuality, disability or religion. Counselors must be aware of what discrimination is because they're required to act within the law and adhere within the work of an ethical framework. As a counselor, you'll come across many people who are very different from you yourself. You must be able to set aside any personal prejudices, assumptions or stereotypes about someone if you are to demonstrate and practice the core conditions. Personal development and self-reflection are your responsibility and you need to continually educate yourself and really think about how you behave towards other people. We then looked at some of the basics around the two main laws that you need to be very aware of. Human Rights Act 1998 and the Equality Act 2010. In the UK, these laws and regulations are in place to protect the rights of all people and to ensure they are not discriminated against. These laws apply to everyone and are in place to protect you as a counsellor and to protect your clients. This course, remember, only gives you some basic information, so you will need to read and learn more about these laws and your responsibilities. We looked at the many forms of discrimination that exist within our society. There was unfair discrimination, unlawful discrimination, direct and institutional discrimination, discrimination by association, multiple discrimination, and then positive action. We looked at the difference between stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. Discrimination is constructed within the society we live in. The stereotypes and ideas we have about other people vary depending on where we live, our country's history and how our values and beliefs have been formed and influenced by what we've been exposed to and the knowledge we have. Stereotypes are ideas we have about other people. 
For example, you might think that disabled people need to be looked after. Stereotypes like this are then translated into how we prejudge someone with a disability. These are our prejudices. And this feeling is then translated into action. This action may then directly or indirectly discriminate against them. So for example, we talked about if we believe a person with a disability is not capable, they are dismissed as a possible employee for a job that they are fully qualified to do. We also looked at the impact of discrimination and how devastating this can be to so many communities within our society. I then talked about the importance of you getting to know your client and not jumping to conclusions um, that they might be being rude towards you or unhelpful or uncomfortable. Perhaps someone's avoiding eye contact, but remember they might be following their cultural norms. So this is not about adopting the other person's culture. It's about communicating that you are accepting. It's also about communicating what's acceptable in the counselling relationship and setting clear boundaries which show respect for each other and your differences. We then looked at what you can do to address difference and diversity and ensure that you are not directly or indirectly discriminated against someone. There is so much that each and every one of us can do to change things. As I covered in the module included thinking about the appointment time you offer someone. Does this fit with school time? If it's first thing in the morning, does it help someone who might need to take medication and rest before they're able to come out? Do you need to put in place other support to help the person take part in therapy? Does the person need a translator? Do they need someone to accompany them? And if they do, is there a place for that carer to sit and wait while you see the client? In the final module, we learned about the seven-eyed supervision model developed by Peter Hawkins and Robin Schuhet in 1985. We then looked at the supervision relationship and supervision is a key part and a requirement indeed if you are going to practice. Within this supervision model, we looked at how supervision helps you as a counsellor and it's not just about reviewing your caseload. It's about the relationship between the therapist and the client, the therapist and the supervisor, and also the wider context in which everyone is placed within society, and the importance of having the client right at the centre of all these discussions, so that the therapist improves their skills and applies good practice which helps the client move forward with their life. We then looked at Gibbs' model of reflective practice. Remember this is a continual process and you keep repeating the cycle and apply your increased level of awareness to improve your skills and provide a better service to the next client you interact with. The process involves describing what happened. Then thinking about what you were thinking and feeling during the interaction. Evaluating what's good or bad about the experience then enables you to make sense of what that experience was like. It also helps you make conclusions about what else you could have done and then putting in place an action plan so that if this type of interaction with a client happened again, you would know there are different things that you would do. You would apply things you know have already worked, but you would also apply the learning and experiences you've had already. So that's all the modules covered in brief. So remember, each part of this course comes together a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. If you decide you're entering into a helping profession, you will need to work on each aspect of this picture. For some of us, attending training and reading books as part of our personal professional development comes easy. And for others, this is the challenging part. For some of us, we have to work more on receiving feedback and developing a more open and more reflective mindset some of us will love the practical experiences we gain from working with clients and for others this can prove stressful and difficult at the beginning. We will need to dig deep and find courage to apply the knowledge we've gained and be present for the people in distress. Becoming a competent counsellor is a lifelong pursuit as we gain skills and experiences 
And just when we think we've mastered an area, another field of our work evolves and changes as new thinking and new practice comes in place. We then find ourselves learning new skills to keep pace with new approaches and applying these so we give the best possible support to our clients. Welcome to the world of what it's like for counsellors. It's worth reflecting on what the benefits of counselling are. For our clients, the impact of counselling can be very positive indeed. We can support our clients to develop new skills and insights. These insights and skills can help them reflect on their own behaviour and help them increase in confidence to make the changes they want to make in their lives. Sometimes clients are not ready and sometimes people withdraw from support because they're not willing to make the changes. We have to respect and accept this response and learn what this tells us, if anything, about how we practice. For us, the benefits of being a counsellor can be just as great as they are for our clients. The process of developing and applying our skills can change our personal lives. It can make us reflect on past and current relationships, and it can help us make peace with some of the mistakes we've all made in the past. And these can help us move forward with personal decisions that we may have been avoiding ourselves. Our increased self-awareness can help us make changes to how we behave and how we live our lives. We continue to learn from our clients and what our interaction with them tells us about ourselves. It's a fascinating, challenging and rewarding career, but you need to decide if it's for you or not. So well done for completing this introductory course. But what next? What have you decided that you want to do? There are so many different choices to make now, but only you can decide what's best for you. I hope this introduction to counselling has helped you think about what door you're going to open next and what feels right for you. If you've decided to pursue a career in counselling, you need to do some research on your next steps. If you've decided to develop helping skills to enhance a role you already have, you'll need to investigate what can help you achieve this. I have a few suggestions to get you started. Think about volunteering. Volunteering can be really useful in terms of understanding how different organisations work. Reading as much as you can about different counselling theories can also be really useful. It can help you discover which theory or approach resonates with you. Personally, I find watching YouTube videos really helpful, particularly when you want to watch some role play of how the counselling therapeutic relationship plays out. There are so many courses available to you, full-time, part-time or distance learning. There are also many courses which are fully funded, so you won't have to pay. There are many options available for you to fit around work, your finances or caring responsibilities. So what does life hold for you and what are you going to do next? Well, if this course has made you decide that this is not for you, then that's a positive thing in itself. Perhaps then you need to think about what would give you the life that you want. Some of you might think that you need to seek some help and support, and maybe this course has raised some issues for you. I strongly recommend that if you do look for a counsellor for yourself, then go through the directories for the National Counselling Society or the BACP. All the people registered here are fully qualified and insured, and they will work within your best interests under their ethical frameworks for their respective organisations. Thank you for completing this course, and I hope you find it useful and valuable in terms of your next steps and decisions you want to make about your own future career. I wish you well with whatever decisions you make. Look after yourself, take care, and best of luck.